So, uh, last week we answered the question, is God, is God um, selfish? And the conclusion we got to the very end was that God is holy. God is holy. It's not a question, is he, um, I'm sorry, is God perfect? That's what it was. It's not a question if God is perfect. It is, it's the fact that God is holy above all things and everything. Um, so this week, the last question I was going to ask for the kids is, is God selfish? Um, and so when I uh, saw that question, uh, the kids, unlike the adults, you know, we told the adults, hey, you just don't have to put your name on it, but the kids are brave. Uh, they put their name all over those questions. Um, so I went to the person who asked the question, and in my thinking, when she asked, is God selfish, I was thinking, you know, God is worthy of praise. God is worthy of all that stuff. And so that's why I was hoping she meant, because that's really easy to answer. Um, I can do that. I can do my eyes closed. But she was like, you know, why does God want all the glory? And I was like, ooh, 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 that's, that's totally, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was one of my children. And I was like, ah, ah, no. No, it was, is God perfect? That was Nixon. Um, and so when the question of is God selfish, uh, it has to do with God's glory. Uh, so we have to explain God's glory. Um, so we're going to get into that. And for that, we're going to go to Psalm 23 to answer the question, is God selfish? Psalm 23. Now up on the screen here, I'll put all the verses that I'm going to use. Um, there's one verse I didn't put on there. It's going to be Psalm 127, but we'll, I'll let you know when we get to that. But I'm going to use Psalm 23, uh, Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, 1 Samuel 13, 24, Acts 13, 22, Isaiah 30, 28, 31, and Isaiah 40, verse 11, Isaiah 28, verse 30, I mean Isaiah 40, verses 20 through 30, James 1, 1 through 2, Chapter 5 of James as well, 13 through 18, and Romans 8, 28 through 30. Now that's going to be up there for a while. So you don't have to worry about it. It's going to be up there for a while. But you're going to hear me reference those scriptures. might even turn to some of them. Okay, so Psalm 23, Psalm 23. So we're going to read that. If you turn to Psalm in your Bible. Psalm. Okay, Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6. And this is what it says. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right. So this psalm is written by David, King David, as we know him. How many of you guys know the story about David and Goliath? That's right, right? Little short red guy took a stone, flung it. Uh, yeah, he was red. It was red, ruddy skin. Yes. Okay, I'm just giving you background. So now listen, I'm going to give you the full background of David, all right? Now, David grew up in a household. We had a lot of brothers and sisters, right? Now, in David's household, um, he, I guess he was the runt of the litter. He was the smallest guy. His brothers were tall. They were tall. They were, they were you know, they looked like the manly part. Now, God anointed him, or picked David to be king. And so he sent the prophet Samuel to go tell David, uh, David's dad that David was going to be king. And David's dad's name was Jesse. Now listen, when Samuel showed up and he said, listen, one of your sons is going to be king, uh, Jesse was like, I, I know which one. He brought all his kids in except for David. David had to stay outside and, and tend the sheep. Right, so David's standing out there. He's tending the sheep, and then when Samuel comes in, God's like, "It's not him. It's not him. It's not him. It's not him." And then he asks Jesse, "Do you have another son?" And Jesse was kind of like, "Yeah, it's 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 he's outside. It's David." Jesse didn't think that any way, shape, or form David could be king. He didn't look the part. He was a shepherd boy. But God told Samuel, listen, don't, don't think like a man. I, I don't look at, at the outward appearance like you do. I look at the heart of a man. So David came in, and God said, that's him. Anoint him as king. So he was anointed. He was chosen as king. Later on down the line, he, be, he became king. He had some issues with the other king named Saul. Saul tried to uh, kill David several times. Um, not a good working relationship 
Okay? And so eventually David becomes king. Now, by the time we read Psalm 23, David's probably well on in his years. We don't know how old he was, but we do know he has some kind of experience under his belt. And you can tell by the way he's written this psalm. So now you got to think in mind, David being a former shepherd understood what it meant to be a shepherd. Look at that first verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, how many of you know anything about shepherding? When was the last time you shepherded a sheep? Probably never. No problem, right? Shepherds depend, I mean, sheep depend on the shepherd for everything. I mean everything. To protect them, to guide them, to lead them. Now listen, David is looking at God and, and David, you got to think about this is the king saying, this is who leads me. This is who I bow down to. If David would have said, listen, I am the greatest shepherd of all time, y'all should listen to me, because he was known as the greatest king there ever was in, the, in Israel. And this guy right here is saying, I bow my knee to my Lord. He is my shepherd. And I shall not want. And why does he not want anything? Because God's his shepherd. God provides whatever he needs. Now, it doesn't mean that God has given David all this money and all this stuff. It's saying that David has total assurance that God is taking care of him. Not only physically, but spiritually. He bows his knee. He seeks the shepherd. He looks to him for everything. And so he wants for nothing. Listen, the man who wants for nothing can't be bought. Because there's nothing that you can offer them. And David is making it very clear. His God, his king, is the Lord God Almighty. He's his shepherd. He leads. He guides him. Now this is a wonderful thing. Even in 1 Samuel 13, 14, Acts chapter 13, 22, David is considered to be a man after God's own heart. David is a man in mad pursuit of God. It doesn't mean David was perfect by any means. This guy had a lot of issues. Family issues, relationship issues. He... Murder was on his category. I mean, this guy has some really messed up stuff, but his heart was always for the Lord. Now listen, verse 2 says this, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters. Now listen, uh, so lie down in green pastures. What do you think that feels like for an animal? To lie down in green pastures. Relaxing. Right? What else do you think? Peaceful. Peaceful. Leaves me beside still waters. Not choppy. Still. Peace. Contentment. Lying down in green pastures. If you are a, a sheep and you eat grass, what do you think when you see green pastures and you get to lie down in it? Huh? Buffet. Buffet. All you can eat. And you didn't pay a thing. Right? It, it, he lies down and it's It's rest. There's rest. And David is saying his God causes him to rest. His God nourishes him. And his God also keeps him at peace. That's who David is saying about, his, about God himself. That, that God causes him to rest. Doesn't it feel good to rest? Mm-hmm. Even if you got issues going on. How many of you guys ever had chaos going all around you? And what do you, what do you generally want? I just want to go to sleep. I want a good night's sleep. You ever feel like that? Or is that just me? Okay, good. It's okay. It's okay if it's just me because I know I feel like that sometimes. I just, I just want me to go to sleep without worrying about everything else in life. And, and, and listen, you got to think, David's a king. So can you imagine the amount of pressure that is, you know, it, the saying, heavy is the head that wears the crown? Can you imagine the pressure that is on this guy? Not only does he have his sin, not only does he have issues in his family, his son wanted him dead. I mean, David had all kinds of stuff. And so, but he's still saying, my God gives me rest. And then he nourishes me. He takes care of me. His word is life to me. And he keeps me at peace. He keeps me at peace. Verse 3 says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Now think about how difficult life is. You're striving for holiness uh, by faith. You got trials. You got temptations. You got disappointment. You got sanctification. You got maturing in Christ. You got relationship problems. Everything is broken and wrecked inside of you at times, if we're honest, right? You ever feel like that? You just feel like, I'm done. I'm just beat up all on the inside. I can't take this anymore. I quit. Brokenness. But what does he say? He restores. 
He repairs. He refreshes. He, he, he makes it as if it was new on the inside. This is His God. This is His King. This is the God that we serve. He restores our soul. And then I, I know we all kind of freak out. How are we going to live for Christ? How, how, how am I going to walk in holiness? And what does David say? He leads me in the path of righteousness. He, he does this and he does it for his namesake, for his glory. God does all of this for him. I mean, he's doing this wonderful thing, restoring what is broken and lost. God built it back up. And then God is going to show you how to walk in a way that brings him glory, honor and praise, a way that pleases him. He's doing all of this. Listen, there's a promise in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 31. Sometimes I got to say it to myself because, you know, sometimes I think I can do everything. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall fall and faint and be weary, and young men shall be exhausted. Shall fall exhausted and obscure, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount upon wings like eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. That restoring is true. That restoring is a promise that if you're weak, if you're broken, and you're pursuing the Lord, God says, I still restore you. If I would fall away from God and start doing my own thing, and, and, I, and the world, like the prodigal son, just beats down on me, and I, I don't know what else to do, God says, I still restore you. Come back. This is, this is God Himself. This is who He is. And then David goes on and says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and they staff, they comfort me. Now think, I'm thinking about walking through that valley of the shadow of death. How many of you guys ever went camping? Have you been camping? You ever walk through a valley when you're camping? Right? Because I've got lost before when I went camping. I, used to, I went camping for a whole summer. And I would take kids out when we go camping. It was my job. And one day one kid left something at, at, at the cabin site and we're at the campsite. And I was like, dude, I got it. I'll go get it. I left to go get it. On the way back, I like, I don't know, maybe I took a left and I should have took a right. And dunked when I should have dived. I've walked into a valley. And that place was creepy. Because see, where the sun is poking, it's, you know, just, whew, there's, there are flowers and there's birds. And, you know, it's beautiful. But then when the sun is not, it's dark, it's scary. You can't see. There was this big tree that, I mean, it, was as, it looked like it was as big as this room. And it was just dark going inside the tree. And so I can either go through there or I can go, go around there. Now, me being the stud that I am, I walked around, okay? Because I didn't know what was inside that thing. But it's scary, right? <laughs> because that's what valleys are. That's what happens in valleys. There's, you don't know what's in the darkness, Right? And, and, and listen, God says, even though you're walking through this valley, because remember, he just said, I lead you in the path of righteousness for my name's sake. So even though you walk through this valley, I'm there with you to comfort you. I, I protect you. I, I, I'm doing this all for my glory, and, and, and I, but I'm with you every step of the way. Listen, the, the Bible says in James chapter 1, Verses 1 through 2, count all joy when you go through trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and patience must have its perfect work, that you may be torn and complete, lacking nothing. All things work out for good those who love the Lord, call according to His purpose. And, 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 and guess what? In the end, He makes us more like His glorious Son, in the image of His glorious Son. So everything that God is doing is for His glory, but it's also for our good. So yeah. You can walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but God is with you every step of the way. And for His glory, He's going to change you. He's going to mold you and shape you. Why? Because He is God. Broken inside, beat up. Yes, I'm here. My God is here with me, restoring me. Tired and weary, He gives me rest. Chaos around me, He is my peace. Now listen. Just looking back over those four verses, just think about these words that you hear. The Lord is, He makes me, He leads me, He restores, He leads me for His name's sake. Even though I walk, you are with me, your rod, your staff. Now, do you notice that everything is from God? Everything. Because it is a question, so is God being selfish in this situation? 
Is God being ultimately selfish by doing all this for His name? So his, that, that, that's not it. God is all sufficient. God is what we need. God is everything that we think that we need. We, we think we, we, we need it in, in our kids, in our spouses. God is everything. It's not that He's being selfish. He's the only thing that satisfies. Nothing else will. It will not satisfy. It will not last. How many of you ate dinner last night? It, it satisfies your hunger, didn't it? Now, if you're like me, 15 minutes later, I'm like, man, I am hungry. Like when I eat Chinese food, right? I love it. I love Chinese food. I tear it up every time. But 15 minutes after we leave, hey, can we stop at McDonald's or something? I just, I just need something. Right? It doesn't satisfy. It's not lasting. It's, it's, it's insufficient for me. And see, this world is just like that. Everything that the world offers is insufficient at best. Everything that we offer is insufficient at best. God is the only thing that completely satisfied. So when God is most glorified, we are most satisfied in Him. And that's why He's the only one that can be it. He's the only one that can do it. It's not that God wants to be selfish and give me the glory. No, that's, that's how we are. That's a problem with us. God is saying, if you glorify me, I satisfy you. If you seek me for your peace, your rest, your comfort, your joy, your everything, your protection. Listen, the rod and the staff was used to protect and direct and guide. If you sin, seek me for those things, this is who I am for you. But you have to come here to me. He is our everything. He has always been our everything. And this is, I love this promise in verse, 23, in verse 5 through 6. It says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Now listen, God is so good and so gracious that the very thing that He's doing, in the presence of those who may hate you, God says, I still choose you. You're still mine. Now listen, that's good news to me because how many of you guys are perfect? Oh, okay, all right, I'm in the right place, right? No one's perfect. We make mistakes. How many of you guys have enemies? No, everybody loves me. No, we have enemies. We have people that, I, I was in high school, I remember a guy said, I don't like you. I said, well, what for? I just don't like you. Okay, but tell me why. I don't like you. Dude, that's not an answer. No, I just don't like you. You don't like me because, because you, you. Okay, I'll work on that. Try not to upset you by being me. But, but here's the thing, though. Even in the presence of my enemies, even in the presence of the devil himself, God still chooses me. God still says, you're mine. And I'm your God. And I satisfy you every time. I am all sufficient. God still chooses. And our cup overflows. That means this is everlasting. Like, isn't it good to know that there's nothing that you could do that would break God's Affection, His redemption, His love towards you. God says you are mine. You are mine. This cup overflowing means it never ends. It doesn't cease. This is an eternal thing. Now He says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So listen, here's the thing about goodness and mercy. What's good doesn't always feel good. Right? Doesn't always feel good. How many of you guys ever been sick? And you had to throw up? You know that's good for your body? Yeah, right? It doesn't feel good, does it? Right? Your heart starts to beat because you feel your stomach touch the back. This was fun. I le- listen, by grace of God, I only threw it once, and I thank God for that. Right? It's not, it doesn't feel good, but getting that stuff out of my system is good for my body. Everything that God has planned for you, the good things that you think are not really good, God says this is for your good. His mercy, unmerited favor, pursuing me all the days of my life, even when I mess up. Even when I fall short of His glory, it pursues me for all the days of my life. And David's final thing was that I'm, I, I should dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not in the house of you. Not in the house of your mom. Not in the house of your uncle. Not in the house of your brother. But in the house of the Lord. Not in the house of, of your girlfriend or anything. In the house of the Lord for how long? Forever. Listen, this should be our desire. 
that we should forever be with Christ, that we should long for Him and desire Him. Now here's a problem though. Here's a, here's a problem we have. God is all sufficient. But we're, we're, sometimes we can be at two different ends of the spectrum. Sometimes we try to be all sufficient for everybody. We try to be the superhero. Right? Listen, when I was a kid, that's what I used to think about myself. I am the hero. I'm the superhero, right? We, you grow up reading comics and, and you, you, you get into it, don't you? You really think that you can do this. You think that, you know what? I, man, listen, do you remember uh, being younger and you thought you were invincible? <laughs> do you know that your insurance for a, a, a male is always high? You know why? Because we think we can do everything. Oh, I can get through this. Hang on. Yeah. Ah, look at that. I'm invincible. Right? We, our leg is falling off. I can still play, man. A, a famous word that we say is every time a guy gets hurt, I'm good. You sure? Man, you look like you're dying. No, I'm good, man. Listen, my leg always do that. Let's play one more game. Right? You think you're good, but you're not. And so we had this idea that we're invincible. We had this idea that we're Superman. And, and, and do you know the, the, the history behind Superman? Right? Uh, initially, Superman was supposed to be a villain. But that didn't go well with anybody, so they changed it and they made him a hero, but they gave him this backstory. The original backstory was Superman came from the planet of Krypton. He was the last son of the House of El. He crashed in Kansas, uh, in Smallville, Kansas, and he was picked up by a farmer named Joseph and Mary. Right? Because they initially modeled Superman after Christ, but they were like, you know what, that's too religious. The religious overtones are too much, so let's just call him Jonathan and Martha. Right? And, and if, you, if you watch any Superman movies, you, you can't tell, you can't pick up on that if you watch the one with um, George Reeves or Christopher Reeves or, or Dean Cain or Brandon Ruth. But the, the latest one, The Man of Steel, they actually went back to that, the, those roots. And, and, and some of the lines that you use are intentional. They say of the house of El. El is to represent God. They, they, they do that intentionally. There's a scene where Superman is wondering... Should I give my life to save this planet? And he's talking to a priest. And the backdrop of the priest is a cross. When they showed Superman talking to him, he's sitting down. And the backdrop is a stained glass window of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were trying to get back to that religious overtone of it intentionally. They wanted Superman to kind of be like, like a, Christ-like figure, a Christ-like figure. And then if you, if you watch the extended version, yeah, or, or Batman versus Superman, once you have to realize, too, the Batman versus Superman was like a court kind of documentary. It's supposed to be Batman and even Lex Luthor are accusing Superman of something that is not right. Kind of like, you know, the religious people accused Christ. And then Superman, what? He ultimately gives his life to save the world. But what happens? He died died, and then what happened? At the very end he resurrected. Right? They they did that intentionally. I'll get you in one second, baby. Yeah, they did that intentionally. Come on, that was that was that was intentional. They did that intentionally. So that's why Lex Luthor is like the devil in the movie. They they did it intentionally. They wanted to, it to look really like that. They wanted to get into that. And so you know, I thought to myself, man, I, I you know we think we can do that, but here's the reality: that's just a comic book. We're not Superman. See, because when I got older, I, I acted like this. I was always a superhero. Joe will come and save the day. Joe's got it. Don't worry about it. When I get in there, man, listen, I'm going to say something, and God, I I mean, listen, God's going to speak through me, and they're going to get saved because I came in the room. You know, listen, if if I'm there, none of this happens. If I was there, that wouldn't have happened. Really. Listen, the Bible says, Philippians chapter uh, 2, verses 11 to 13, that, that, that ultimately God works His will and His good pleasure through the power of the Holy Spirit through us. It's not us. It, it's Christ working through us, the hope of glory. But we get this mentality that we are the superhero. That we come and save the day every time. That, that it, if, 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 if it's us, if we can get in there and do it, we, we, we're going to save the day and we're going we're gonna to change everything. And what, we, what that does to people is they start to look at us as if we are like a... a God Himself saving the day, and we're not. We're not. The, we're not the shepherd. We're not. But see, the thing is, we get so 
entrenched in that, we believe we are. And, and, and instead of carrying our cross on the earth and, 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 and bearing our cross in the name of Christ, this is the only cross that people will ever see of us. The one that takes us to our grave because people will mourn the fact that we're gone. Because we try so hard to, to be everything and to do all this stuff and to be superheroish. We try all that so much that our body and inside is being torn apart. Stress. Heart attack. Stroke. I, I read about pastors who have fallen apart. Who have had mental breakdowns. I do that intentionally. Not so I can see the end. I want to know what led to that. How did they get to this point? Because it dawned on me, I can't be the superhero. I, I, I can't save anybody. I, 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 I'm, just, I'm just as frail. I'm just as weak. And, and if, if, I'm, if, I, if I am only making people believe that if I show up, things will change, I have failed. If, if I think in myself that, well, if they just listen to me, it'll be different, I have fallen. I have messed up already. I haven't led them to the cross. I've only led them to myself. And, and all they're going to do is mourn my death and cry over my cross and never pick up their own. We can't, we can't be that for people. Because we're going to put people in a position where they don't know who the real God is. They will never know the Lord is their shepherd. They will only know us as their shepherd. A realization I came to was, listen, there is nothing I've ever said or ever done that has led anyone to Christ. And I'm going to explain what I mean when I say that. It was never me. It was Christ working through me. And so, I need to submit to that. That was Christ bringing glory to himself through me. Using me in that particular situation. Now, if I, if I, if I think it's always been me, then it means I'm going to go everywhere trying to do it all over the place. Well, if, let me talk to them, man. They're going to come to Jesus. No, they're not. Well, let, let me talk to them. If I pray, it's going to change everything. What, what if God doesn't want to use me in that situation? What if he wants to use somebody else? It's never been us. We are not the superhero. The good shepherd, Jesus, that is who they turn to. So instead of letting them mourning over this kind of cross, what we need to teach them is how to surrender to this one. We need to teach them how to bow their head and their knee and, and go before the throne of Christ and surrender and give everything. That's what we have to teach them. Imagine this. You never teach your child how to drive. What do you get to do for the rest of their life? Drive them everywhere. Worry. Worry. But if you teach your child how to drive, what is, what is the joy in that? They, they Give them a bus to go. Oh, mercy. They, they, know, they know how to go and get direction. They, they know how to drive. They know how to do it. If, 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 if we teach people how to surrender to Christ and let Him be all and everything they ever need, how, how to let Him be their good shepherd, then guess what we've, guess what we've done? We've effectively discipled somebody and brought them to Christ. We've effectively changed their life forevermore. Have you ever had a situation where nothing you did seemed to work? You feel powerless? Right? It, okay. Yeah, I know I have. And so what do we do? We pray. We pray. And we seek the Lord. And then, have you, have you seen that situation? God just miraculously just... It works out. And what do you do? But I thought I had to, you know, show up and like, man, if you do it again. No. You thought you, man, I'm going to come down there and, I'm gonna, and when I speak, they're going to be like, oh, man. Because what do you do? You play it on your mind, don't you? Right? You play the whole scene on your mind. I'm going to say this and they're going to say that. And I'm going to say this and they're going to say that. And then boom, they'll be like, you know what? you right. My bad. And you're like, yeah, I know. I know. I know. Right? And it doesn't work out like that. Just like you don't even do nothing. And God just says, woof. We'll talk to you later. Right? <laughs> because he's the good shepherd. He's the shepherd. And so listen, the greatest lesson you can ever teach your children, children, is to seek God as the shepherd. The greatest lesson you can ever teach them is that God is their peace, not you. 
If you solve every problem for your child, what, has your, what problem has your child ever solved? What have they learned? This, this, is, this is what, I mean, I, my mom is, is key on telling me this. I'm too old to raise your kids, Joe. They're going to do what they want. So either you can trust God or you can die early and your kids can come live with us and they can do whatever they want. It's a hard lesson. Listen, I, I, I've been sick before and I can tell when the stress has made me sick. I'm 35 now. I have to actually think, do I want to be around for a wedding for my child? Do I want to be here? Or do I want to teach my child to trust in the Lord? And, and if by God's grace I'm still here healthy and, and good, then great. But I don't want to end my life because of I'm too stressed. I want God to be glorified in this. So I teach them who my God is. And I show them how to bow my knee. Listen, prayer is an awesome thing. Rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord always. Present everything with prayer, supplication, and request. Make your request known to God. And then the peace of God that passes all your understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verses uh, 4 through 6 and 7. Thank you. Right? And listen, so this is what this is ultimately prayer is our solution to this. So is God selfish? No. God is all sufficient. And we teach others how God is sufficient. Now, last week we opened it up to questions when we got to the end. And so we're going to take a couple of questions and then we're going to do communion. All right. I, I see you. I see you. I'm going to get you. Yes. If God knew sin was going to come to the world, why didn't he stop him? If God knew sin was going to come to the world, why didn't he stop him? Okay. No problem. Okay. So we look in Genesis, right? Um, God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of this tree. God gave man that free will to make a choice. God created man to glorify him, but God gave man the free will to make a choice what they were going to do. God, God isn't trying to force us to love him. It's a choice we have to make. And so man chose to sin. They chose to love sin more than they love God. But the good news is we're redeemed. We're redeemed. Amen. Okay. It was too much yes, it was too bloody. Oh. Do you have any other question besides that? Okay. So yes, is God prideful? Is God hate? Is God prideful and does God hate? Okay. Good question. Uh, tough, tough question. Thank you. It, ooh, Lord, I'm going to try. Um, is God prideful? No, God is not prideful. Even though he made us, we are still his, and God gave us free will because he wants us to want to love him. This is the opposite of selfishness. He gave us his own son to die. God deserves the glory. God is not prideful, and it goes back to what we kind of talked about. God is all-sufficient. Thank you. that. God is all-sufficient. And so, I mean, God is sufficient for us. So it's not that he's prideful. It's that God is trying to say he is exactly what we need. Does God hate? Okay, so... Um, yeah, uh, I, I need to grab a Bible real quick. Uh, does God hate? Okay, so how many of you ever heard the phrase, hate the sin, love the sinner? Okay, what scriptures that come from? Yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> Psalm 5 says this. Now you have to listen to all of this to, to, for it to make sense. Psalm 5 says... Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not for you are a God who does not delight in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boast which not stand before your eyes, you hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord upholds the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Alright. Now does that sound like God hates sin and sinners? No. Okay. So, difficult answer. Yes, that's what it says. God hates. God hates that. Now, before you go, oh wait, God hates sinners. Before you run out from that, John 3. John 3, 16. 
For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Who believes in him and is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he's not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. Whoever who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Whoever does not... Whoever does, but whoever does what is true comes to the light, so they may clearly see what works have been carried out in God. So does God love the sinner? Yes. Right? If we say God hates the sin but loves the sinner, we, we miss out on the part that our relationship with God is messed up because of our sin. Remember last week we talked about Isaiah and then the, the wrath of God was coming out? Right? Listen, if we just say God hates the sin but loves the sinner, we're missing the part of we, our relationship was messed up. If we say that God hates the sin and hates the sinner, we're missing the part where there's redemption. Right? Now, so how do you explain that? You now, don't go out here telling people God hates you, God hates you, God hates you. Don't do that. Don't do that. What we're saying is your relationship is, is struggling with God right here. This is a messed up relationship, but there's redemption. God loved us so much that he did not end it there with his wrath. He said, no, I, I, I love you. I'm not, I don't want you to experience my wrath. The Bible says that God wants no one to perish. So this love that God has is so overwhelming even to us that it, it pierced through his own wrath and said, listen, I will take my wrath, take my hate upon myself because I love you. Because I love you. Now listen, I'm not going to condemn anybody if you say, well, God hates the sin and loves the sin. I want to condemn you for that. When we look at God's word, God makes it clear that sin and that sinner, we have a relationship rift. And, but I'm the bridge. I take upon my own hate and my own wrath for you because I love you. And that's the redemption in that. And that's a tough one to even explain. Any more questions? No? Okay. Huh? He's like, look, he looked at you like three times. <laughs> oh, did you have one? No. Oh, did you have one? You sure? Okay. All right. Write the 50 down. Yeah. All right. Did I answer your question, Amber? Yes. Did I answer your question, Current? Okay. So, is God selfish, though? No. What is God? Holy. Sufficient. Thank you. Thank you.